happens every year at the number of people who get flu uh, in uh, the United States, you can see that these numbers can be pretty high and large numbers of people can die as well, you know. So uh, having 73,000 people die I I from a flu year is not necessarily an unusual occurrence. So we have to recognize that and therefore we're lucky that we have the vaccines and if we all have vaccines, the, uh, most of the years the vaccine works well. The problem is that the coronavirus can mutate very rapidly as the flu virus can. And these viruses basically by mutating mean that you have to have a new flu shot which is developed each year for the new mutation. So let's look now at the coronavirus uh, epidemic. Uh, obviously, large numbers of people have died throughout the world. Uh, just to put it in perspective, uh, the United States is at the upper end of the deaths. Uh, United Kingdom has obviously done worse than us because their politicians have behaved even worse than the American politicians. Uh, and Belgium has had real problems, virtually all in their nursing homes. So it's sort of interesting that that's where they've had the deaths. They did nothing at the beginning to protect the people in the nursing home. Peru has most probably done worse. Uh, Mexico, by the way, is way down here. And Taiwan, who got the first import of the flu from China, have virtually no deaths per million and virtually no flu. They shut down immediately. They did all the proper things and Asians find it much easier to wear masks than do people uh, in the United States. So let's accept that that is an important thing. I'll keep on coming back to it. If some of you don't want to hear it, you should leave now and recognize that just stay away from everybody else because those who don't wear masks are going to go out and kill people. And that to me is a form of murder. And whether you believe your president who doesn't think that everybody should wear masks or the vice president or you want to believe the new president who at least I mean, thinks we should wear masks, so that's a good start. It's not a political thing. You've got to wear a mask because otherwise you will kill other people. The mask protects you a little bit, but it kills other people if you have it. And lots of people have this virus and are asymptomatic. So we know now that this is all over the place, and we know that we get a large amount of influenza each year. Uh, in 2017, uh, 49 million people in the United States had influenza, and you can't see the numbers there, but it was somewhere around 70 million died. So huge numbers die every year from flu. Obviously, usually amongst older people, and we need to accept that, uh, the coronavirus has now exceeded the amount, uh, the amount of people who die from flu in any given year by quite a bit. Uh, we're in going on to 250,000 at this moment in time, and obviously we need to get it under control. Uh, global deaths uh, due to the, COVID, uh, the coronavirus, you can see now quite clearly, um, malaria is the second most every year, and that's been going on forever and ever. So recognize that while we've got now nearly 500,000 people who've died from COVID, malaria every year kills about 256,000. Malnutrition kills about 209,000. I came out of Africa and I will tell you that in a civilized world, which we're supposed to live in, people dying of malnutrition is un acceptable. This is a failure of every civilized person in the world. So you can get where I'm coming from. And you can see that around the world, we kill as many people, well, at least half as many people as are dying from COVID, which is equally unsuccessful. And then we can work our way down through all of the other deaths that we tend to have. So I want to give you a case history because physicians like to talk about cases. This is a very good friend of mine. He's a geriatrician in Madrid in Spain, Alfonso Jose Cruz Gentile. And he said it started on a Sunday in the mountains, more precisely near the summit of Serrera del Almenara, next to the Robledo de Chavlin, where I noticed the first chill that I attributed to an imbalance between the amount of warm clothing and the coldness of the wind. Nothing else. I felt strong and capable. I returned home after more than a 15-kilometer hiking in perfect physical state, shape. 
Uh, the next morning, he started to feel extremely weak and tired. He had a constant dry cough, growing fever, and a particularly annoying system. Everything tasted bad, sweet or salty, with an excessive perception and without the nuances of, of uh, uh, flavors. This didn't stop him going to work because he was the average stupid doctor, and doctors think they should go to work anyhow. And so he kept on going to work. And as he said, this was the sin of presentism. Uh, eventually, one of the occupational therapists said, if you keep on coming to work, I am not coming back to work. You're the most dangerous thing at work. So he then decided to stay at home. Uh, uh, the second night after he stayed at home, his wife, who's also a doctor, stayed up all night watching him because she thought she, he might die, and he went to the hospital. Just after he got into the hospital, two ICU doctors came to see me. They said it was a courtesy call, being a partner. I began to consider the fact that you may need mechanical ventilation, sleeping without knowing if you will wake up. Obviously, the Spanish doctors are not very nice, because I don't know how I would feel if a doctor came and told me, I'm most probably not going to wake up, but I'm going, they're going to ventilate me anyhow. Uh, so he didn't think it was very nice, and it uh, did not improve his mental fragility. He could not be prone, which is one of the big ways of treating people with COVID. Usually you can lie flat on your stomach, and for two months he couldn't do this. So he was sick a long time. Um, a week uh, after a week, when he, uh, his oxygen continued to drop, he couldn't uh, breathe deeply with a burning sensation difficult to describe and a desynchronization of breathing. Then when it was over, he slowly started a rehabilitation program. I stopped using the oxygen concentrator and started doing breathing exercises and walking. First five minutes around the room. I remained exhausted, but it was going to be better every day a little more until I got to walk over an hour at home. At first, I couldn't climb a flight of stairs without stopping. Little by little, I came to do three stairs in a row. Yes, drowned and desaturated, improving slower than what I would want, trying to gain weight. After the summer, I hope to go back up to a mountain, some mountain. When I get to the top, I will know I am the same again. And he is an extraordinary optimist about everything, as you can see. But he, he's showing you that a young person, he's in his early 50s, can have a lot of problems. So what is it that COVID does to us, COVID-19? Well, it starts off with most people with a runny nose, a cough, a sore throat, some sh amount of shortness of breath, some chills, uh, and then you start to drop your oxygen. A number of older people do not have fever. The CDC and its brilliance has this list of things that you're supposed to pull out to see whether or not you have COVID, and it has fever on it, and it has a whole set of things, which if you live in Missouri, because we have sinusitis and allergies, cough and all the other things, almost everybody has. So CDC has told us we've all got COVID before we start. And the only people who've got COVID are most probably amongst the older people, the ones without fever and certainly in the asymptomatic. So we have to recognize that the CDC didn't help us very much either. Uh, we get liver dysfunction. We can get heart problems. I'll talk a bit about that later. Uh, chill blains uh, because of little clots in our leg and, uh, and rashes deep vein thrombosis, your kidneys can be damaged, uh, you can have trouble with your muscles, you can get colitis and diarrhea. About 10 to 20 percent of people with COVID present first with diarrhea. If you've got a type 2 diabetes, it can damage the uh, pancreas and uh, cause you to basically change over to a type 1 diabetes, not being able to produce insulin anymore. Uh, you tend not to be able to smell, you can't taste well, and you lose your ability to eat, and that causes anorexia and weight loss. And then central nervous system, older people particularly get very confused, they have headaches, they have an increase in falls and stroke. Uh, important to recognize that one of the things we see a lot of with COVID is we've gone through lockdown periods, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. But we've got to recognize that when we lock down, many older people don't exercise, they don't do anything, and they develop what we call sarcopenia, which is muscle loss. And that puts you at major risk for developing bad disease down the line. If you get bad COVID after you've been locked down, you start off in a bad place 
And then your cytokines, those are those inflammatory little things that float around in our blood, uh, and they basically affect every part of the body. They affect the muscle, and they then tend to pull basically protein off the muscle. And when you start to do that, you get what we call cachexia. Uh, there are ways to measure it. But cachexia is a very bad condition because it takes forever to recover from it. Um, we have to recognize that when people who are not thinking well, if you've got cognitive problems, if you've got true dementia, and you get COVID, you're going to be con more confused. You're going to have delirium. You're going to be frightened. You're going to be feel helpless. You're going to get angry. You're going to be depressed, and you're going to have denial. All of these require a lot of caregiver help. So this becomes really difficult for the caregiver. And in addition, with the COVID lockdown, many older people don't understand the social isolation. This is particularly difficult in the nursing home. And social support has sort of disappeared for older people. We pe Older people say, where are my friends? Why can't I see my family? Uh, who will help me? And particularly, they tend to run into trouble not taking their medications properly. The one thing I want to point out, because we live in a torturous country, this is a country who thinks it's okay to torture old people. We tie people down in hospital. This is totally unacceptable. No matter what you want to believe, it's unnecessary and un un unacceptable. In England, if you tie somebody down, a nurse ties somebody down in hospital, they are fired and they go to jail. Uh, in America, they are told how good they are. I mean, it terrifies me. This I've fought throughout my whole career uh, as a geriatrician. You do not tie people down. It's torture, and it makes them worse, not better. So you need to be aware of this. And if you have a loved one who's getting tied down, explain to the caregivers that this is not good care and that they should learn to be good caregivers. I hate the fact that we think torture is okay in the United States. I don't understand it. I failed totally in trying to teach people in the United States this, but it drives me crazy. Okay, how do you get diagnosed with COVID? Well, hopefully you all knows, know now that we, we stick a thing up your nose and they, we do a PCR reaction. It's very accurate accurate. They've developed a number of other tests. The newer app rapid tests are basically much better than the one Mr. Trump showed us on TV, which was about 50% accurate. That was the first Abbott one. It just didn't really work. It was a 50-50 chance of whether it was going to be right or wrong. And also, with any of the tests, the first couple of days, there's just not enough virus around to pick it up. It detects, obviously, these tests detect those who are infected. And then later, if you've been infected, we can measure antibodies. And uh, there are two antibodies that can be measured, and those detect those who have had disease, but not those who are necessarily actively sick at the time. And you'll see the robot there that's been developed in some parts of the states. Not only do we like to tie people down, but we don't think that nurses and, and doctors should go in to see people because it is dangerous. Being a doctor is a dangerous life because you're always at risk of being exposed to infections. But in these, basically, we save the doctor and the nurse having to go in to see the person. It can all be done with a robot. And this is not necessarily good for the patient. I don't know how you'd feel if you were being looked after by a robot, but I'm not certain. I like robots, so maybe I would be happy. Okay. So after you've gone through the disease, which can usually take about two but up to four weeks of being acutely ill, you need a rehabilitation period. As uh, was said here, I couldn't stand, I couldn't walk, could get out of bed by myself, uh, and now I can walk. She said, I'm walking with a walker. And you need a lot of help from a number of different allied health professions to get you working. Uh, up at the top, just above my head, you can see Mikel Esquerdo. He is from Spain, and he decided something that I tried to get done the whole time I was at St. Louis University, that we should exercise people in hospital. And uh, while we believe we should tie people down, that obviously means we don't want to exercise them. Again, I don't quite understand this, but this is where it is. And what he showed was exercising people in hospital, having an exercise therapist come in for 10 minutes for each person twice a day, actually totally changed the outcome for the person. And we need to recognize that that happened. Uh, 
in addition, uh, Mikel has, uh, has put together an exercise program called Vivi Trail for those who, when you're in lockdown, you should be doing these and you can do them. There are different levels for different older people. It's an excellent exercise program that you should be aware of. What about nursing homes? So I'm showing you some pictures here of one of the Spanish uh, nursing homes where when the Spanish army came in, they found residents dead and abandoned. You've got to recognize that old people in nursing homes are at tremendous risk of having disease spread very rapidly throughout the nursing home. And you'll say, well, that's the only sort of thing that happens in Spain. But Governor Cuomo, basically in New York, when the hospitals got full, told them they had to send the old people out into nursing homes. And most of the deaths that occurred in New York occurred in the nursing homes. That was basically a really stupid thing to do. It was done in Missouri, uh, and uh, we had none of the equipment available when we started off for PPE, you know, that stuff that you cover yourself up. We had no ability to test staff and patients. In one of the nursing homes we worked with, uh, we basically asked uh, the state to come in and test, and the state said, well, you're doing such a good job. You've had no problems. You don't need testing. Two weeks later, they had a third of the nursing homes sick. And basically, it turned out that these were two of the staff members who were asymptomatic when they got to testing. I put that down at Mr. Parsons' uh, uh, death approach because as he didn't think, uh, and neither did uh, the, county, uh, uh, the, the county executive think that it was worth our while testing people, they went ahead and let a lot of people get killed. So if you think I'm a little miserable about this, I think we did an incredibly bad job. And we have to recognize in nursing homes, most of the nursing homes who are COVID post positive, the people in it are asymptomatic. So you have to get people tested if you want to be able to make sure we don't run into trouble. Uh, why do nursing homes have so much trouble? The population is very vulnerable. Uh, when we're old, our immune system doesn't work well, old people have atypical symptoms, and nursing homes are high-touch care. And you can't do this without transmitting to other people from one to another. We have to recognize this as part of it. So the next thing that we have to be aware of is when you're through the COVID syndrome, it doesn't mean that it's over. Your cute goes away, and then things start to come back. Uh, Carol Todachin, a, a Native American, said, seems like it's been a long journey in these last two months of recovery. I'm making progress and starting to walk independently with a cane. A little at a time, but getting there. We all know, or many of us know, because we've had children or friends who've had this, that if you get viral illnesses such as infectious mononucleosis, sometimes they can drag on for months with acute sickness, with fevers, uh, with irritability, problems thinking, fatigue, pa uh, muscle pain, and mood disturbance. And we have to recognize that we now know that this is true for COVID. This is called the long COVID syndrome, where you can remain confused, fatigued over a long period of time. You don't want to eat. Uh, you keep your conjunctivitis, you're still short of breath, you still have a cough, the food still tastes terrible, and then you can get chest pain, and your chest pain can occur during the acute COVID or beyond. This is due to an infection of the heart, and the great example is Eduardo Rodriguez, the Boston Red Sox pitcher, who couldn't play this year because when he went back to play after he had had his COVID, he found that he could not pitch through a single innings. He used to get exhausted at the end of the single inning, and he had had COVID of his heart, and it stayed around for a long period of time. We find that we get changes when we stand up that alter the blood pressure. Uh, we may get long-term kidney failure. Obviously, the muscle that we lose during the acute uh, episodes does not go away, and if we don't exercise and continuing exercise. This takes a long time to fit, uh, fix, and people with long COVID are very commonly falling. They also have joint pain and muscle pain. So a lot of things happen to you beyond. So even though 
you might have survived the COVID. It's absolutely important to realize, don't say to your mom, well, yeah, it's over now. You can't keep on saying this. You're just making it up. And I've seen this happen to lots of older people where they told, ah, you know, you're over it. Why are you still going on? It, you know, certainly for the first three or four months, nobody thought that really people should be complaining that long. So we have to recognize that. It's important to recognize that COVID, like many other conditions, you need to have advanced directives. In the 15,000 people that we have looked at in Missouri for advanced directives, it turns out that one in three roughly does not have an advanced directive. You can change your advanced directive when things change, but it's important that people know what you want to have done with you. Do you want to go on a ventilator? I will tell you, I do not want to go on a ventilator, and I felt that way for a long time as I got older, because basically the misery of a ventilator may or not may not make me feel better. And basically, we have to know what we want, and it has to help people down the line. It is definitely that, yes, no one should be excluded from getting a ventilator. That doesn't make sense. But if you don't want to go on a ventilator, you shouldn't have to go on it either. You should have choices about what you want to do. And this is absolutely key when we're dealing with modern medicine where, quite honestly, we can do all sorts of things to you, many of which may or may not make you better. And so you have to have a doctor you trust, and then you have to have an advanced directive to help the doctor do what they can do. But importantly, an advanced directive when you say you don't want things done doesn't mean that they won't do anything. It means they won't do the things you don't want, but you will still get good care and good care, palliative care. If you have palliative care, you live longer than if you don't have palliative care. So people who need palliative care, need palliative care, they will live happier and longer. And it's really important that we all recognize that. Okay, next thing to realize is lots of people who die with COVID, their family are totally devastated because basically here's a family member who is having real problems and you can't see your family member, you often can't communicate with them and, and, and certainly not in a natural way and you didn't have the ability to say goodbye. This produces prolonged grief and post-traumatic stress uh, disorders in, in many of the people and we need to have, recognize and have support for people who have gone through watching their loved one die. Now we come to how to, what can we do for COVID? Well, we don't have to talk about the drugs because they don't work that well. What does work well is being six feet apart. If you are six feet apart, you are going to do much better. Uh, and if you're not six foot apart, you're going to be six foot under. You're missing that, my face is hiding the six foot under. But it's really important to recognize that. Uh, you also can't go and socialize. Uh, up there is a restaurant where one person had COVID and went in. Uh, basically, they all ate. And you can see those circles of all the other people because of the air conditioning in the restaurant basically got COVID. So COVID spreads very quickly in the indoors. What does this tell you? It tells you Thanksgiving and Christmas are coming up. It tells you that you can't go out on Thanksgiving and Christmas and assume that your family won't be sick. And I most probably am the best example of that because this weekend, two of my grandchildren were having a birthday party and I told my wife we couldn't go. They were going to go golfing uh, at the golf place and uh, you know where you hit the balls as far as you can. And I said, it's stupid to go because they may well be infected and we're not going. Uh, my family were very unhappy with me. Two days after, my daughter basically was diagnosed with COVID. Now the whole family, with the exception of my wife and myself, are quarantined. So think about what you do. Your family can bring it to you. If your family's been away, you can see them outside at a distance, but don't bring them back into your house and be on top of them. The second part <coughs> is obviously you need to wear a, a mask. Predominantly, the masks protect other people. There's been a bit of stuff from the CDC now saying it also protects you. It does protect you, but it's about a 5 to 10% protection for you 
and about a 95% protection for other people. But it's good to protect other people. There's nothing wrong with trying to stop other people getting it because if you stop other people getting it, then other people won't come back around and give it to you. The vaccines are coming. This is very exciting. Uh, both Pfizer and Moderna now have these vaccines that are RNA vaccines. They appear to work very well. They appear to have limited side effects, okay? Uh, but remember that Cambridge, who has one of the uh, uh, more normal vaccines, the MRNA ones are very different uh, from uh, the ones that we normally make. They had to shut down a couple of times. The, per people, the Chinese virus has caused them to shut down in Brazil because of potential side effects. People get neurological and other problems sometimes related with vaccine. It's very rare. It's not a reason not to have a vaccine, but we need to know that it's not happening a lot. And so this is one of the questions and why you couldn't just say, well, the vaccine's here. We can start giving it to everybody and not test it. We need to know it works properly and we need to know it doesn't give you side effects. I think we're very close to having vaccines and when the vaccine's available, you need to take it. Um, we live in America. Isn't it wonderful to live in America? We all can make our own decisions about what we want. So there are whole lots of people. There are people who don't think their children should have measles vaccine and quite happy to see them die. I don't understand this. You know, it's totally beyond me. We know measles vaccine works. We know it's safe. Why would you not get vaccine? But if we look at the United States, basically uh, about 30% of US adults have no plan to get vaccinated against the COVID. <laughs> and Americans 18 to 24, uh, only about 40% of them are prepared to have a vaccine. If you don't vaccinate that population, all the rest of us are going to get it. Um, you can read the political statement there. Uh, you know, not my fault who gets vaccines and who doesn't. It's the same who wears masks and doesn't. Makes no sense to me. This is not a political statement. Uh, and people in the United States say it's okay to respect the choice of someone who doesn't want to get vaccinated, doesn't want to wear a mask. This is stupid. Okay. All I can tell you is if you want to kill off the whole of the American population, it's fine. This is how you work with a pandemic defense. You keep your physical distance, you wear your mask, you have hand hygiene, you avoid touching your face. If crowded, you limit your time. Um, you need fast and sensitive testing and tracing. You need good ventilation. Uh, you need uh, government me messaging and financial support to do this. You need quarantine and isolation and you need vaccines. And it's only when we put all of this together that we will have good outcomes. Lockdown is a problem. Nobody likes to be locked down. But throughout the world, if we don't wear masks and don't distance, then you finish up having to lock down. When we get so much disease, we finish up with locking down. And as that uh, post box says, if you're reading this, you're a COVID idiot, go home. And the other thing that happens with lockdown is we see increased elder abuse. You know, we, my wife and I came back from Europe just at the beginning of the pandemic, and we spent two weeks on lock, lockdown to a large extent because there was one whole case in Toulouse, which is where we come from. There were many more cases in St. Louis, but we were told we should lock down. So we locked down at the end of the two weeks, we were ready to kill one another. You have to recognize that locking people down is not good for their mental status, if not anything else. Social isolation, important to recognize, and Marla will talk about this next week, but the loneliness epidemic is beyond us. About 10% of older people are tremendously uh, lonely, and loneliness causes stress, depression, quality of life, poor sleep, a worsening mentation, impaired function, cardiovascular disease, increased hospitalization, and increased mortality. The head of Biden's uh, coronavirus uh, task force, Dr. Vivek Murphy, who was a previous Surgeon General, said, during my years caring for patients, the most common pathology I saw was not heart disease or diabetes, it was loneliness. No one should be lonely, but it's often unavoidable. At SLU, we have developed a quick loneliness questionnaire uh, are you emotionally attractive to others as a friend? Are you lonely? Are you outgoing and friendly? Do you uh, feel you have no friends? Are you emotionally upset? 
This is to try and get the people who can't make friends. A subset of people who are lonely uh, are just can't make friends. I mean, you know, uh, I would argue that I, I always live on the edge of this because I can't stop talking, as I'm sure you've worked out by now. And that fundamentally, you know, that becomes annoying and then you don't have a lot of friends if you don't stop talking. Remember that with the uh, uh, COVID outbreak, as you see here, people had to distance. This was not good. We moved to telehealth, and at least that one gentleman managed to both find a way where he could uh, cuddle his grandmother, which I think is a very important thing. What about loneliness? How do we fix it? Marla's going to talk about circle of friends. There's been a lot of stuff with robots uh, and trying to say, can this work? Uh, in uh, Europe uh, and Australia, they've developed friendship uh, benches and chat benches where people can come together. Obviously, those aren't going to work in COVID time, but the, uh, down here at the bottom, the robot you see there, this is from Mexico City where they brought the robot in to talk to people in hospital because the people were not getting to talk to anyone. <clears throat> so the next problem we've run into is one that's not new. As George MacDonald said, age is not all decay, it is a ripening, the swelling of the fresh life within that withers and bursts the husk. Um, Grandma Moses, as all of you know, uh, developed arthritis in her early, late 70s, and she took up painting and became one of the most paid famous paintings in the, in the world because her arthritis stopped her quilting, which is what she was famous for before this. Uh, Corot said at the age of 75, if, uh, 77, if Providence gives me another two years, I believe I shall still be able to paint something beautiful. And there you see what he painted the next year, the gypsy, gypsy with the mandolin. And uh, Kachuka Okusi, uh, sorry, the Japanese painter, painted all his life. And what he said as he got older was, I drew some pictures I thought fairly good when I was 50, but really nothing I did before the age of 70 was of any value at all. When I am 80, I shall have developed further and I will really master the secrets of art at 90. There are many, many good things older people can do, but nevertheless, there is a large pushback about older people. And I'll show you some of this quickly. Robert Butler, when he was directing the National Institute of Aging, brought up the concept of ageism, prejudicial attitudes towards older people, old age, and the aging process. And he fought back and said, we have to stop this. This is not a positive thing for older people. And we all know that multiple people uh, use multiple bad words about older people from geezer to ha hag to crotchety. I don't mind I'm a crotchety old man, but nevertheless, we have to recognize it's not positive when you hear these things when you're older. And Donald Trump at age 73 was talking really about sleepy Joe Biden at age 77. Uh, that's not much different in age, so I don't know why he was being ageist in that case. Language has a deep and profound impact, and yet it's often used flippantly. Uh, when we look at aging and ageism around the world, there are huge numbers of people who are abusive to older people, they treat them unfairly. 57% uh, of people in Europe believe that older people uh, don't contribute to the economy. People over 70 have the lowest perceived status in European society. Um, and we've said that basically elder abuse occurs when people are being ageist, and particularly in the time of COVID. Ageism is all over social networking. Multiple studies have shown this, uh, and even Facebook, Older generations are prepared very poorly, despite the fact that a lot of us who are older are on Facebook. Um, on Twitter, which I do a lot of, basically, most tweets of, when COVID came out were related to older uh, adults, and they were bad personal opinions, personal accounts and jokes about older adults and COVID. Uh, a quarter of the analyzed tweets had ageist uh, uh, pieces in them when it was looked at. Um, we have to recognize older people 
are usually the victims of when things go wrong. Hurricane Katrina, 60% of the victims were over the age of 60. 80% 80 of the individuals who die in heat waves uh, are over the age of 50. And then came COVID. So ageism in COVID, not surprisingly, became a big thing. We are looking at the boomer remover, which is what people talked about. In Italy, they did distributive justice and said, if you were over 65, when COVID broke out, you weren't entitled to have a ventilator. And that's what happened in Milan. Uh, many healthy younger adults initially ignored recommendations to socially isolate to protect their older relatives. Uh, my favorite, Governor Dan Patrick of Texas, suggested that older people considering himself would volunteer to die so Americans don't lose our whole country. Uh, well, I will tell you that I'm old and I'm not in a hurry to volunteer for most of the millennials. They're getting better, but you know, I'm still not in a hurry to volunteer to die on their behalf. And who counts when we count cases and deaths from COVID? Basically, we tend not to count the old people as often. Ageism can be hostile, neglectful, and often benevolent. I show you here pictures of successful aging people. You see the president and the, uh, and the president-elect of the United States, both of whom are over 70, the Dalai Lama, Pope Francis, and then Queen Elizabeth, who I think is 97 or 98, and is still functioning as well as anybody. Uh, sort of think of this as if you go around the circle and you finish up with Queen Elizabeth, she's without doubt one of the most highly functional old people in the group. Um, workplace discrimination became a huge problem. Unemployment rate in people over the age of 65 quadrupled between March and April when the COVID virus came along. So we're getting near the end and I wanted to basically give you a bedtime story for your young, for your grandchildren. Now, if you already have grandchildren, you most probably don't want to tell them this one at this time. This is when COVID is over. And this is the imagine that you need to do. Imagine when the world was covered by pollution. Not a star could be seen in the sky. White Americans shot young black men for fun. A wall was built to keep immigrants out. The UK brexited from the EU. Ageism and racism were common. Children starved throughout the world. Middle-aged people in the USA died from obesity. The ruler in Saudi Arabia had a journalist killed and few cared. From Yemen and Africa to beyond, people fought war. So, and a little man in North Korea threatened to start a nuclear war. Imagine things could get worse when a small virus with a crown swept through the world, killing large numbers of people. Some called it the boomer remover. Others just said no ventilators for the old, or said old folks will die to save the young. People isolated in their houses and some became depressed. We masked and didn't come within two meters of one another. Well, a few did. Pollution disappeared. Others got guns and protested that they should not need to stay at home to save old people. There was not enough PPE for health providers. There was an economic crisis and no people working. Many could not afford food. Those who already had three or more guns went out to buy more to shoot the little virus. Politicians blamed everybody but themselves. And then came a vaccine. People no longer stayed outside. People no longer wore masks or socially distanced. People were much nicer to one another. People used electric cars and flew less uh, uh, to keep pollution away. Uh, people were excited to go to football games. But then they went back to being as they were before, self-centered, not caring about others, and the world was sad again. Uh, I leave you here with this artist, Marilee Shapiro-Asher, in 1918 had the Spanish flu. Uh, she had COVID-19 when she was 107. Uh, it shows that basically COVID does not, and pandemics, do not discriminate, and we do not quite understand why some people die and other people don't. But it's extremely important that we try our best not to infect people. So the storm will pass, the sun will shine again, and vaccines will come. The shining of the sun we are close to, as long as people will wear masks, as long as people will socially distance, and as long as people will get vaccines. So I hope all of you will go out as a force after this and convince people that doing the things that are right will solve the problems for all of us. Thank you all very much.
Thanks, Dr. Morley. Um, Maria, I don't know if I don't see anything in the chat box. Um, but so please, if you have questions or comments, please uh, enter them in the chat box or just unmute yourself. Um, and since we don't have any waiting um, and ask a question or make a comment. And I'm quite happy for you to complain about the way I see it, because I know 48% or so of Americans don't think they need to wear masks. They don't care about vaccines. They don't care about anything except themselves. And, uh, you know, if you're in that 48%, I'm sorry I insulted you, but you deserve to be insulted. And my <laughs> version, sorry. <laughs> so we do have a, a, a question in the chat box from Martha. Um, what is the name of the book of the 107? 107 year old. Oh, let me see if I can go back because I never can remember it. Dancing in the Wonder Years uh, for 102 years. Dancing in the Wonder Years. Yeah. And uh, she's uh, the oldest person uh, who survived COVID was 113. She was a young lady uh, in Spain. So, uh, but this one managed to survive two pandemics. Um, what are the what are, from, from from Gail, we have. I appreciated all your comments. Good info. Have has there been an uptick in like other diseases related to COVID or or increase like strokes, um, heart yes. attacks, things like that yes. that have been contributed to, or have have we seen an increase in those deaths? Yeah. Um, during during this COVID pandemic? So COVID clearly can increase strokes and increase heart disease. And we've seen some increases in these. The interesting thing is diseases as seen have gone down because to some extent, nobody wants to go to the hospital. You know, if you go to the hospital, you know that everybody there has got COVID. So people have stepped back, you know, for a long time, you couldn't get elective surgery done. And in fact, they're starting again to consider doing this. Uh, this is a problem. We won't know in the end how many of the excess deaths were due to COVID that we're seeing and how many were due to the fact that people didn't go and get treatment. You know, if you're sick, you need to go and get treatment. You can't, shouldn't sit at home with chest pain saying, well, I'm not going to the hospital because fundamentally I might get COVID and stay at home and die from your myocardial infarction. You know, again, it sounds stupid, but this is what people have been doing. You know, so I assume that all of us are the same as all of the people who are doing these things and that all of us deep down do, do some really silly things. You know, this is what life is about. So we're not going to know until the COVID epidemic is over what, what percentage that died were not from COVID, but were from not getting treatment. And obviously, a lot of people have not been going to their doctors. We've obviously moved to a lot more of telehealth. Telehealth is a learning experience. I think that we're getting much better at telehealth. And my belief is that when the COVID epidemic is over, large numbers of us won't have to go and see the doctor, but we'll be able to have most of this done at home, which will make a big difference because you won't have to sit in a waiting room with all the sick people around you. And you know, so you won't pick up your, their cold and their flu. By the way, I think I forgot to say it, but you have to get your influenza vaccine uh, this year, because if you don't, you're going to have the problem of going into hospital and people won't be too certain what's wrong with you. And really and honestly, not to get an influenza vaccine this year would be a little more than silly. Uh, cretinish, maybe. I can't think of a bad enough word. I, all the words that are coming to my mind are all not the sort of words that decent people use. But you know, really, get your influenza vaccine, please, before you kill yourself and the people around you. So a uh, question from Marianne, why is it okay to be in a ventilated room, but restaurants with AC or fans is not? So it comes down to how good the ventilation is. If you have really good ventilation. So in fact, it turns out that on airlines, the ventilation in the airlines on the whole is very good. So they have not had nearly as many cases of COVID as people would have expected from people flying. Uh, but it comes down to the quality of the ventilation. Most of the ventilation is not that good in restaurants for the number of people they have. So, you know, it's how well you're ventilating. Uh, 
and it's difficult to say. You know, most restaurants may are trying to keep keep people apart, but keeping people six foot apart, having them there for a fairly long period of time. I mean, you know, when I go to a restaurant, it usually takes an hour to two hours to get in and out. I mean, if you're going to fast food so a place and just pick the food up, it's one thing. But two hours in an area where COVID is floating around is enough to get it, particularly if you're not masked and the people are not masked. And, you know, I can't imagine going to a restaurant and being masked while I'm in the restaurant and trying to put my food underneath my mask. It just is not something that's doable. So it comes down, if you've got really good ventilation, it's okay, but you've still got a distance and you've got to keep people a reasonable distance. That's the other part. Remember, you know, that in that restaurant, the people were distanced. They were reasonably distanced. They got it because the ventilation was carrying the COVID. And I don't know enough about ventilation to say which ones carry it and which ones won't. Question from Katie. Are there particular symptoms that affect older adults more than younger? You discussed that briefly, but it was very quick. Okay, so older people tend to have much more muscle loss uh, in, in general. Uh, they are maybe at a slightly higher risk of getting uh, the strokes, the clotting disorders, because older people tend not to move around as much. And so they're... Uh, that's a possibility. The immune function is worse for older people. So when you're looking at the disease traveling throughout the body, how it travels in the lungs and things like that, those are much more likely to be worse in older people. And obviously, older people are much more likely to die. So the problem with the immune function, yes, as a type 2 diabetes, that's a disease of middle-aged and older people changing to a type 1 diabetes. That's obviously a disease of older people. Uh, but on the whole, older people also don't have a lot of the symptoms. Older people often present, no matter what the disease, without the classical symptoms. So you have to recognize it goes both ways. Okay. Um, last comment that we have is from Christy. Thank you, Dr. Morley. This was all fascinating. I appreciate the history of pandemics too. So we are at... 1059. Um, Maria, Susan, uh, or any of the other... Um, oh, wait a minute. We do have one more question. We will do that and then wrap up. So Amy asks, what suggestions do you have for staff and residents in assisted living communities where residents are feeling isolated, depressed, or anxious? Thank you for everything. So the suggestions are that everybody should have PPE. That includes the residents and the staff so that you can actually come into contact with one another, number one. I, I think that basically, you know, in the, uh, one of our nursing homes, we use the Hasbro cat. I showed that on one of, one of the pictures. Uh, the Hasbro cat and other robotic things can help a little bit. Uh, using uh, Zoom and interaction, finding ways for people to get outside and meet with one another, you know, reasonably socially distanced with uh, masks, uh, keeping people busy. I mean, one of the biggest problems in nursing home was that all the activities that they have in nursing home virtually ground to a, a stop once they got COVID in the nursing home because they can't bring people close to one another. So it's being innovative, thinking about how to do it, and it's not easy. I mean, the most important thing is regular testing, and I would say that's true in assisted living as well as it is in nursing homes. Anywhere where people have basically a, a group of people coming together all the time, you've got to test regularly. We're seeing this now in the schools and the colleges where, you know, particularly in colleges where somebody actually believed college kids would go to college and not go out and party. I mean, you know, I'm trying to think when I was in college, could I have gone two nights without partying? The answer is totally no. <laughs> okay, so I'm not surprised we're seeing exactly the same thing now in the colleges. The problem is those people who don't get that sick usually uh, and often are asymptomatic are going to come home for Thanksgiving and they're going to bring the disease with them to the poor old people who are going to meet with them. And then we will see another outbreak because 
obviously we can't learn, we can't hear the message. And we've got to, as Americans, hear the message. We're an extraordinarily bright, very well-educated country. I do not understand why a bright, well-educated country cannot understand that socially distancing, basically wearing a mask and getting your flu vaccine, and then when the COVID comes, getting that is so difficult for people to understand. It's just totally beyond me because, you know, and I hate washing my hands and doing all these things, you know. So I'm a great example of someone who would find any reason not to do it. And if I can do it, I don't see why the rest of Americans can't do it. And we need leadership to wear masks, tell us we've got to wear them. <clears throat> we need, if necessary, to find people who go out not doing these things, you know, because quite honestly, you know, it's like wearing a seatbelt in a car. I remember when we first had to wear seatbelts in a car. I said, no way am I ever going to wear a seatbelt. And it was only when they started finding me when I wasn't wearing my seatbelt that I decided maybe I should wear a seatbelt. And I was bright enough to know wearing a seatbelt was most probably a good thing to do. You understand? So uh, we have to understand that we are, as a nation, as a people, we do silly things. We've got to stop doing silly things or we're going to have the pandemic around longer. And thank you all for coming. Please remember, none of you are silly. You're all much cleverer than I am. So I know that you're going to change this world for us. Thank you all very much. Great. Thanks, Dr. Morley. Um, Maria, Susan, any final comments before we say goodbye? Uh I was just going to say, I can't think of a better way to kick off this collaborative and all the, and our virtual presentations. So thank you so much, Dr. Morley. I, I'm always entertained by you. So <laughs> I'm you sure everybody else seriously, is Seriously, right? It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think your warnings are um, uh, openly accepted to a lot of people. So, uh, so thank you for being that expert. So we'll see everyone hopefully back next Wednesday at 10. And I will uh, build on the comments that, that Dr. Morley made today about loneliness and social isolation and, and talk about um, some additional information about that. So thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Have a great way, rest of the week. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Marla.